Hi, everyone. I'm Chris D'Agostino. I'm the Global Field CTO with Databricks, and I'm here today to talk to you about how you can transform your organization and enable data and AI at scale. This is really a view from the lake house, which is an architectural concept introduced by Databricks, and I'd like to talk to you about the details of that today. For those of you that don't know Databricks, we're a data and AI company. We were founded in 2013, and we have been on a mission to help data teams solve the world's toughest problems by allowing them to use a simple platform to bring together all the different personas within their organization to have a shared view of data within the organization and to enable all forms of analytics. And we'll talk about the details of that. We have over 7,000 customers globally ranging from the Fortune 500 to the unicorn digital native startups. And we've been recognized by Gartner as both a leader in the data science and machine learning platform, which we've been recognized for a few years now. But more recently, we've been recognized as a database management system. And that's because of the introduction of an enterprise data warehouse. So for those of you that are in organizations that are moving data to the cloud, and you're thinking about data warehouse solutions, the Databricks platform provides a unified capability for not only your machine learning and data science workloads, but for your SQL-based analytics as well. The Databricks platform is built on a bunch of open source projects that we created. Databricks was uh, founded by the creators of Apache Spark, which is the de facto standard for big data processing. But as part of the investments that have been taken on by the company through venture capitalist fund raises, we've basically created a bunch of other open source projects that we uh, contribute code to. We shepherd the uh, roadmap for these open source projects, and they actually serve as the underpinnings for the platform. And those are Delta Lake and Machine Learning Flow, and then one other open source project called Redash, which provides the visualization capabilities that you'll see in the platform. You see a list of customers uh, here. These are global customers, but we actually have a lot of customers in the Asia Pacific area. And I'll talk to you just about a few of these. Uh, Grab, as everyone I'm sure knows, is um, using our platform to do customer 360 across customers in over 300 cities uh, within Southeast Asia. Atlassian, based out of Australia, has been using our platform for quite some time to better understand the telemetry of how their customers are using the Atlassian platform. And there's a whole list of other companies here uh, that you can see. But specific use cases across a broad range of industries, and I've mentioned both Grab and Atlassian, but Dream11 is using the platform in order to support over 100 million customers with their fantasy sports uh, interests and in the Philippines, Coins PH is delivering machine, machine learning powered solutions uh, for fraud detection for over 10 million customers. One of the benefits of the platform is we help bring organizations along this data and AI maturity curve. If you look at the lower left hand corner of this graph, you'll see that that's where uh, most of the enterprise data warehouse functionality has existed for quite some time. These are represented by the dots in red. Along that curve, you generally bring in data, you cleanse it, you generate reports, you might be able to do ad hoc queries and do some data exploration, but it's really a rearward looking view of how the organization has performed. What customers are really trying to accomplish is moving to the upper right hand corner where the data and AI maturity is along the X axis and your competitive advantage uh, is on the Y axis. So you're moving from rearward looking view, understanding what happened and maybe why it happened to predictive analytics and then uh, automatic decision making, you know, machine based de decision making. So you go from what will happen with predictive modeling all the way up through making the best decision on behalf of both your customer as well as your company. The Databricks platform actually enables you to bring data in from all different parts of your organization and start to achieve this data and AI maturity curve uh, more easily. And when we did a survey using uh, a partnership with MIT, we actually studied 351 companies around the globe, uh, a third of which were here in APJ. And the number one regret that most data leaders had was that they didn't standardize 
using open, open standards. Instead, they chose proprietary capabilities and felt themselves locked into a particular vendor or a particular solution. And so the number one regret was that they wished they had been more open and using more open standards. And only 13% of those that were surveyed actually felt like they were achieving their data and AI goals. And the reason for that is because architecturally, they had a very complex architecture and they didn't actually have um, an easy path to moving from that rearward looking view and enterprise data warehouse capability to more of a forward leaning machine learning first. Of the companies that we surveyed, the majority of them were already in the cloud and over 56% of the respondents in APJ said they were actually in the process of evaluating the new data platform more than any other location on earth. So this area is actually really ripe with innovation. And as I mentioned, lots of the leading companies in, the, in data and AI and providing customer 360 and banking services and, and different types of use cases, those customers are using the Databricks platform to achieve their goals. One of the things that we notice with successful companies is they have a very well-defined strategy. I won't walk you through all the steps here, but I just want to highlight a few things. So generally speaking, it is really important if you're doing data transformation and if you're moving from on-prem into the cloud and you are working to transform the way in which your business uses data, you need to establish the goals and the anticipated return on investment up front and get the buy-in from the most senior execs within the organization. Successful companies are having the CEO and the board of directors actually bought into the initiative. And the benefit of this is that it becomes a business imperative Everybody inside the organization understands that in order to do more with data, in order to you know, increase revenue, decrease cost, and lower your risks, you need to actually be able to have all of the key stakeholders in the business aligned around this transformation initiative. As part of that, you're going to need to be able to build successful teams, meaning hire the right people, figure out what the right talent is for the use cases that you need to uh, build out and, and deploy. And in step two here, we talk about identifying and prioritizing those use cases. We have an ebook, which we'll give you a link to, that actually gives you a scorecard associated with a use case and helps you determine whether or not a particular use case is ripe for, act, for, for deployment and, and building that out. Step number four is what I'm here to talk to you about today, which is a modern cloud-based data architecture. And the decision you make in step number four can really make the following steps in five, six, and seven much easier. It can ease the requirements around data governance and compliance, meaning not do away with the requirements, but actually simplify the ability to, to support them. It can democratize access to data and it's quality data that actually matters. Google published a white paper called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Data. And in that white paper, it said that a less sophisticated machine learning model trained with high volume, a large volume of high quality data would outperform a more sophisticated model that was using lower quality data. So the goal here is not to go out and hire the best machine learning experts you can find. If you can do that, great. If you can afford it, great. But it's not a requirement. The most important thing you can do as an organization is generate a large volume of quality data that you can depend on as your single source of truth inside of a lake house architecture and be able to train models off of that. Off of that. But the advantage there is you also get to do other workloads, which we'll show you in, show you in a bit. Part of this then simplifies the user experience because instead of using a bunch of different tools and needing to have users train up on those tools, understand the data formats, understand the security access models, and move data between these different tools, the Databricks Lakehouse platform and architecture gives you one user experience that is tailored for each of the personas within your organization. And in a few slides, we're gonna show you what it looks like to actually be logged into the Databricks environment and how, based on your persona, you can be very efficient and very productive with your work. Organizations are faced with many build versus buy decisions. And the key recommendation here is maintain your competitive advantage. Most organizations are in the business of extracting value out of their data in order to gain new customers and keep the ones that they have. 
they're not in the business of doing infrastructure and plumbing uh, in order to run the uh, architecture and the different tools. What you'd love to be able to do is have a SaaS based solution that you can trust. It's secure. It's in the cloud. It scales up to satisfy your workloads. And it actually en enables your data engineering teams and data science teams to focus on getting value out of the data. And then finally, steps nine and 10, you move into production, you onboard use cases, and you need to be able to monitor costs and, and see that consumption is actually taking place. Databricks is a consumption-based business. So our goal is to help you get use cases onboarded, help you monitor them, help you uh, set budgets associated with the amount of spend that you want. And we have all of that baked into the platform because we don't earn money unless you're successful with the platform and driving use case consumption. So what are we seeing when we talk about step four? We're seeing organizations move to the cloud, but oftentimes they are replicating the environment that they have on-prem. And what you see here up at the top, across the top, is the data warehousing, the data engineering, the data streaming, and the data science and machine learning capabilities all of these things, as you see in the, the second row here, are kind of siloed off from the different personas. And if you look below that at the tech stacks that get deployed, you'll see a list of, of different open source capabilities and commercial capabilities. The problem with this here is that you have so many different parts as part of this architecture. And you see in the red dotted lines, you see the way in which data moves from one silo to the next, oftentimes copying data. And now you've got a synchronization issue. And the overall architecture is just simply too complicated. So is there a way to actually solve these problems and reduce the architecture uh, complexity? There is. The lake house architecture is designed to bring together the best of two worlds. The data lake capability with its openness and ability to support different data types and different data workloads, as well as the enterprise data warehouse, which allows you to run business intelligence reports and SQL-based queries. So let's talk a little bit about those two types of platforms. Most organizations think about it in the way that you see here on the screen, which is we want to do data warehousing. So all the items in the lower left-hand corner are left for loading data into an enterprise data warehouse. Choose your favorite EDW and load that data in, structure it in a star schema, and run a bunch of reports against it or queries. On the right-hand side, you see uh, data being loaded in to a data lake for artificial intelligence and machine learning workloads. The problem is these two platforms create unnecessary duplication of data and create unnecessary cost inside your environment. You can actually achieve you know, eliminating the coexistence here where you've got you know, separate copies of your data, you've got incompatible formats for the data types, you've got different security models and different governance models between the two platforms, and you've got an incomplete set of use cases on either side, either the data lake which supports your data science and machine learning and data streaming work. It doesn't support your EDW work. And on the enterprise data warehouse with all your structured data, you can't do any ML work very easily on that platform. So what we've done with Databricks and what we're excited to share with you today is the uh, enterprise data warehouse, the, the lake house architecture, which starts with this notion of one platform that brings together all of the capabilities that you are familiar with, with an EDW and with the data lake, but through a governance model that allows you to load data into the environment, you can catalog the data using our Unity catalog. And what you see here on the screen is the ability to, from one user experience, be able to look at what data sets you have in your environment. And we can inventory not only your data warehouse tables and you know columns and things like that from a data warehouse perspective, you can actually bring in files from your data lake and you know, the things that are in your buckets, uh, stored in your buckets, like let's say Amazon S3, and you can inventory that information here. All of this data, instead of it being in, in separate environments, is under one lake house architecture. And it's all backed by uh, low cost object stores. So if you're in Azure, if you're in Google, if you're in, uh, in AWS, you use the object-based storage to bring in all this data and you use the Unity catalog to be able to inventory it. What you see on the screen here is 
uh, information about the data sets that are inside your environment. So you'll see the data lineage, which is on the right hand side that demonstrates the way in which data is moving through the environment. It gives you uh, sample data so that you can understand the shape of the data. It indicates whether or not there's sensitive information and it tells you about the periodicity of the data, how often that data comes in and what's the average size. In terms of machine learning and data science workloads on Databricks, again, all of the data is stored inside of the low cost object store. You've got the Unity catalog, which enables you to discover the data in its most raw format through its most curated format. All of this information uh, we, we sort of track as bronze, silver, and gold levels for the data. So as you land raw data from your source systems, it's considered the bronze layer. And that bronze layer is really great for your data science workloads. You can do a lot of experimentation. You can do a lot of feature engineering. All of that's built into the platform and built into the user experience that you see here on the screen. So for your Python-based developers, for example, they just switch to the data science persona and the user experience around Databricks conforms to the type of workloads that they uh, perform most. And it allows you to do all of the pre-processing of data. It trains your models, it deploys them into uh, production and it monitors their performance. And so you've got native support for Python, Java, R, Scala, and it talks directly to Delta Lake, which is the um, ACID transaction capabilities built into the Delta open source project, which is the foundational layer for the lake house architecture. When data lands into the lake, uh, the Delta lake capabilities kick in and do things like schema enforcement, support ACID transactions. It provides data quality checks so that you can uh, determine whether or not data is coming in and is of good quality. And then of course it provides uh, the lineage support that I mentioned during the Unity catalog talk. The data engineering workloads, we know that this is a big challenge for most organizations. Oftentimes they're using different tools to move data between disparate systems. Uh, when you think about the ETL process, you think about the idea that sometimes multiple jobs have to execute in, in sequence. And so what happens if you've got three jobs that need to execute in order to move data from uh, one state to a more curated state? What happens if job two fails? How do you roll that back? Well, Delta Live Tables, which has uh, been introduced with uh, GA release, so it's uh, generally available on all the platforms, so, you know, each of the major cloud vendors. And what it does is it gives you the ability to visually see how data is moving through that ETL pipeline. And it manages the infrastructure on your behalf. So should a node fail, it automatically restarts. Should a job fail, it understands what it needs to do to either roll that back or restart the job again and get it completed. And what you're seeing here on the screen is this idea that data is moving through the, through the platform and you're having different capabilities or different processes act on the data, and you're getting metrics about uh, what percentage of that data is good quality data. So you see here, 90% is, is made it through all of the data quality checks. I mentioned to you that organizations tend to think about the data lake and the data warehouse as two separate platforms. Databricks has solved that with the lake house architecture by bringing the capabilities of the enterprise data warehouse together with the data lake capability. So SQL workloads on Databricks is now available. So you can actually have the same performance that you're used to seeing with an enterprise data warehouse with one copy of your data. So the data lands in the data lake and the lake house architecture and all of the capabilities of the Delta Lake open source project as part of the Databricks platform kick in, you curate the data to its most uh, refined format. So you go from bronze to silver to gold. And when it's in that gold format, that's where you can have your star schemas that you're used to thinking about when it comes to an enterprise data warehouse. And now you see here, the persona is a SQL based developer and that interface gives you a native SQL interface for an analyst. So you're seeing the select statement build out from you know, a, a table and a where clause for that predicate pushdown. All of that SQL based work, you know, SQL workbench style interaction takes place directly inside the Databricks platform. So your data engineers, your data scientists and machine learning and your SQL analysts are all working from the same view of the data 
They're all inside uh, the Databricks platform and they're able to collaborate and share code. So it makes it really great for teams with different personas and different skill sets to interact. And I mentioned Redash, which is another open source project. Databricks acquired the company behind uh, Redash. And you see here on the screen, the ability to generate very nice looking business intelligence reports native to the platform. So you don't need to use a third party external BI tool, but if you do, any of the major tools are designed to work with the Lakehouse architecture and give you fantastic reporting capabilities as well. But we wanted to deliver a platform that actually gave you capabilities natively inside of it so that you didn't need to leave the platform uh, if you wanted to standardize on Databricks uh, throughout your organization. So this is the Lakehouse architecture. As I mentioned, it runs on all of the major cloud providers. It allows you to bring in your unstructured, your semi-structured, and your structured data into one environment. It has Delta Lake, which is based on that open source project, as the way in which you can uh, curate the data, you can improve the data quality, you can ensure that it, it adheres to the schema and the data quality checks. It supports ACID transactions. So just like a database, you have the ability on your general purpose data lake, you know, an object store there, you have the ability to uh, do upserts into data sets and have the reader see a consistent view of that. So this is innovation being brought to you right on top of the standard data lake, and it allows you to keep just a single copy of your data and run all of your data workloads. It's all made possible by Unity Catalog, which is the thing that inventories the data that sits inside the lake house. And as I mentioned, it can even inventory data sets that sit outside as you're working to transition to the lake house architecture and bring more of that data in. And then it brings together all of the different personas that are listed across the top here in green uh, and allow them to work together in a team sport like manner. So we've got a few uh, things to share with you in terms of resources that you can take away from this talk. Uh, the 10 steps in that strategy and some of the details around the lake house architecture are available to you through this QR code. And it's a guide. I'm the author of the guide. So it's about a 60 page ebook that walks you through step by step each of the 10 uh, key points that I mentioned in, in the strategy. In addition, we have a series of workshops that are coming up and you can look at very specific types of use cases from reshaping retail banking with personalization and looking at customer experiences to uh, look at fine grain demand forecasting and personalization in media and entertainment. So this is on the 6th of May at 12 p.m. Singapore time. They're live workshops, so please look at the QR codes and, and scan those and, and join us, and we'd be glad to, uh, to walk you through how the Databricks platform enables these different types of use cases. So that's it. That's a quick overview of the Databricks platform, and happy to take any questions. Lynn, if we've got any questions that have come in, uh, be glad to answer them. Okay, um, we have a question here. How does Databricks envision the future of data and analytics in the ecosystem being built around the Lake House paradigm? Well, thanks for the question. So, you know, we, we paid attention over the last few years to the improvements that have been taking place in the hyperscaler space, right? The, the ability to do parallel reads from object stores, the, the fact that these object stores can have be very performant because they're using solid state disks. The network IO is, has improved. And so what we've done is we've built the Databricks platform to take advantage of the changes in the underlying infrastructure and give you the performance that you've come to expect, say from an enterprise data warehouse. So we, we see the changes with the Lakehouse architecture that more and more companies are adopting this single platform approach instead of bifurcating their data and creating multiple copies of the data to store in different platforms. Any other awesome. questions? Um, this other one that asks, what are some of the unique data challenges that you foresee in the next three to five years? Yeah, I think that the key thing in the next three to five years is more organizations are going to want to 
uh, not only build out machine learning capabilities, but deploy them into production and feel confident that they can trust that these machine learning capabilities are, um, are, are making good decisions on behalf of the business. So when you think about ethics in AI and um, transparency and reproducibility, all of this is built into the Databricks platform. So the Delta capability of Lakehouse gives you the gives you the high quality and high volume of data that you need in order to train the models. And then machine learning flow, ML flow, uh, which is another open source project, gives you the ability to do the experimentation, feature engineering, uh, train the models specifically, deploy those models, understand um, what models have been deployed into production through the model registry and run the heuristics. So I think what, what you're gonna see is more and more people deploying machine learning models that need to understand how those models were built. They need to ensure that the models were trained using data that's of good quality and that the data doesn't have any inherent bias in it. And the Databricks platform gives you visibility into each of those. Got it. And I think this is the follow-up question. Um, what is the role of data modelers while using data like house? Do we still need model? I'll need to model our data in the lake or in the warehouse. So if you're going to use the warehouse features of Databricks, uh, you definitely have to model it into a schema like you would in any other enterprise data warehouse. The benefit of the Databricks platform is you can actually use the curation and, the, and create an additional structure out of the data, not only for the purposes of uh, doing enterprise data warehouse uh, workloads, you can actually use it for structured streaming. You can use it to uh, run decisioning engines that are based on ML to train the models, uh, you know, for the machine learning models to train them from the data that's stored in the data lake as, as you've added this additional structure. The, the cost benefit to organizations is they don't actually create a separate copy of the data and the cost to pull data out of a data lake is incredibly cheap. So uh, the benefit is when you bring data into the lake house architecture, you still have to do the, the modeling that you would want to do for all of your SQL based reporting, but you have other data workloads that are machine learning based and data science based that benefit from that added structure as well. Got it. Um, also, I know that we mentioned about the industry specific. How would uh, any specific use cases or customers' stories or um, successes that we see in Lake House um, industry specific wise? I'm sorry, Lynn, you, it broke up. Are you asking if there's like industry specific examples? Of the lake yeah, house? Yeah, of, yeah, industry specific lake house impact and any um, successes that we saw that we could share. Yeah, I mean, the, the companies that I mentioned kind of at the beginning of the briefing, Grab, Atlassian, uh, Dream 11, they're using the lake house architecture to run all of their data workloads to include their enterprise data warehouse workloads. Um, we recently did an industry benchmark to demonstrate that our data warehouse capabilities uh, could perform equally well with all of the other uh, sort of standard EDWs. But the one key takeaway was we saw a 12X improvement in cost. Uh, so if you're really looking to minimize your cost but not give up on the enterprise data warehouse capabilities, the platform is a really good platform for that. We're seeing widespread adoption uh, across a lot of industries. Got it. And I think we have time for one last question. Do you have any advice for other leaders that are just starting out to solve data and AI challenges? And what impact that you think can this turn in today across Asia Pacific? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing a lot of innovation in Asia Pacific. And what I would encourage leaders uh, here, you know, for the, for the event, I'd encourage them to take a look at the Databricks Lakehouse architecture. If you're thinking about data transformation or if you're moving to the cloud, give yourself and your organization an opportunity to rethink your architecture so that you future-proof your investment. Don't, uh, don't think that you need to take everything that you have on-prem and just shift it and move it into the cloud. Uh, that oftentimes uh, just replicates the complexity, it replicates the cost, 
and the proprietary nature of these platforms that you see on-prem. Uh, the Databricks platform is open. Uh, it's built on open source. It's built on open standards in terms of file formats. Anything that you do with our platform doesn't lock you in. You can actually take the data sets and move them to other, you know, other tools if for any reason the Databricks platform isn't meeting your needs. But um, I know that we're, we're just about at time here. Um, so I think it'd be great if I could uh, hand it back to Deboshri. And we uh, request that the de delegate visit our virtual booth during the networking break at Bytes 2022. Thanks.